If you watched the last episode I made covering the site, you might remember me mentioning that Power of Three was, among other things, the beginning of a new type of Warriors content, supplemental material. In between releases of the main series books, the Aaron Hunter team also began releasing different, separate stories in various different mediums, and this is the first of those entries, The Lost Warrior, the first third of Greystripe's adventure, which itself is the first Warrior Cats manga. Now, a few things may catch your ears there. First of all, yes, I am not misspeaking. These were called mangas, right on the front of the book, and continued to be termed as such for many years. I couldn't tell you why. These graphic novels were not made in Japan, weren't made by Japanese writers or artists, and aren't drawn in any Japanese-esque style. But this is what the Warriors comics were called for a long time, and you will often hear older fans, myself included, referring to them as mangas, since that's what they are known as at this point in our minds, along with what they are still called in some online shopping and reviewing spaces. Secondly, if you're a newer fan, you might be surprised to hear that this is only the first third of Greystripe's story. Well, in ye olden days of Warriors past, this was the only way you could get Greystripes and a few other mangas, as arcs of three comics each released several months apart. While the colored re-releases that some of the arcs received were printed all as one book, they were originally separate entries, and because I am working on this series chronologically, I will only include the first third as we were given it. Speaking of chronology, though, The Lost Warrior came out on April 24th of 2007, the same day as the site. While the story was plotted out by Vecchi and the editing team, as it usually was, the author for this book was Dan Jolly, I apologize if that's a mispronunciation, and the illustrator was a man called James L. Barry, who you just might have heard of before, as he has become the main illustrator for the Warriors comics. This book also begins with a quick little message from an anonymous Aaron Hunter that I suspect may be Victoria Holmes, where they explain how exciting it is for them to have Greystripe back, and in visual form no less. They go on to praise the beautiful illustrations and action scenes, and how the manga version of Greystripe doesn't have to do as much thinking and can get across his feelings with nothing but a brooding look at the camera. Whatever your thoughts on the resulting book, it is clear that this mystery Aaron Hunter was very happy with and proud of the product. There are no allegiances for the mangas, but The Lost Warrior has a total distinct cast of 16 cats, with various other unidentifiable cats speaking from time to time. Between the shorter time frame and the tighter stories the mangas tend to have, only four chapters in this case, along with the number of random cats that can pop into the background to say one line without ever identifying themselves, the named casts of these books will tend to be much smaller. This trend also makes it impossible for me to determine she-cat percentages, since we never get to learn the genders of half the unidentified background cast. Since there are also far less lines in a far shorter story, for both the mangas and one other type of upcoming supplemental material, I will measure the percentages of lines from the top five cats instead, and for The Lost Warrior, that is 93%. The vast majority of those lines are gray stripes, with Millie in a distant second place and no one else getting even 20 lines in the book. This is definitely a far cry from any material we have dealt with before. Even the making of this episode has been different. Since I'm talking about a work that already is in a visual medium, rather than drawing up a random scene from my head, I'm drawing my own version of one of the comic panels. This one. Despite all the changes, this book does still have a plot and is part of the warrior's world like anything else. So let's get into the story. We open with what technically counts as a prologue, despite not being labeled as such, where we get a visual scene of the two legs and their cranes tearing apart the forest, with a reminder from Greystripe that this is his home. We get to see, from his perspective, the moment in Dawn where he attacks a two-leg to distract them and help all the captured cats escape at the cost of being captured himself, as he is trapped behind a cage in the monster. We then move to our first taste of completely new material with a dream Greystripe has about the day he met Firestar and then losing him in the whole of ThunderClan in the mists and flames as he and his friends are torn apart, a metaphor, of course, for their current circumstances. When he wakes up, he is in his Tulik nest, where he has been for at least a quarter moon, which is approximately a week. Greystripe is still finding it appalling and impossible to believe or get used to, despite his two legs actually being quite kind, and him often enjoying their company and cuddles. Even if it feels nice, it also feels deeply wrong for him to be stuck inside and away from his clanmates. When he sees a brief moment to escape out the door, he goes for it, and is stopped, first by the two legs not letting him go, and then by the extreme number of new and intense sights, sounds, and smells that overwhelm him as soon as he steps outside. But soon enough, he is able to stay in the backyard without much trouble. When the two leg kids try to play with him using a mouse toy, he mistakes it for a real meal, and when he realizes what's happening, he tears it up in disgust, making one of the children cry and the other get mad at him. Greystripe feels bad for upsetting them, but desperately wants to get out, and so starts exploring the neighborhood. 
He is scared off by a dog, then a mean two-leg with a lawnmower, then by a monster, and before he knows it, his two legs bring him back inside again. At this point, the two legs keep a tighter grip on him, not letting him outside and catching him every time he tries to escape. Graystripe responds by intentionally scratching up their curtains and stairway posts. I am glad that his two legs are so nice. <sighs> anyway, he eventually manages to slip out, but gets lost in the endless trail of identical suburban backyards until he is stopped by a local mean cat called Duke, who actually manages to beat him. Graystripe feels down on himself for losing to a kitty pet, but another cat assures him that it's alright since no one has ever won against Duke. This new cat is another, much nicer kitty pet named Millie. You might have heard of her before. She offers to show Graystripe around and get him back to his house, since she's seen him around and knows where his two legs live. That night, Graystripe has a dream where he meets Silverstream and Feathertail, who tell him that they, and Stormfur, are doing fine. Then they leave, though they promise that they will always be with him. This dream spurs Graystripe on to become more serious and systematic about his plans to escape, the first step of which is sneaking out to meet Millie again and learn the layout of the neighborhood. However, two cats tell Graystripe that Millie isn't around and can't meet him. They then ask if the rumors about Graystripe are true, if he used to be a forest cat who ate bones. Graystripe takes this opportunity to fiercely declare that of course he ate bones, particularly those of lazy kitty pets like those in front of him. Naturally, the two cats are terrified and run away, and Graystripe doesn't think this encounter was as fun as he expected it to be. All he's really feeling is lonely. Cut to a few days later, where Millie returns and explains that she was on vacation with her two legs. She takes Graystripe into some woods outside the two-leg place, where the now very excited Grey Tom shows her around and tells her all about ThunderClan. Millie is enthralled by these stories, and asks Graystripe to teach her how to hunt, then fight. Even though Graystripe is hesitant and unconvinced about her capabilities to match his skill, he turns out to be miraculously surprised as Millie ends up being a really fast learner and manages to catch a mouse and master some fighting moves in just the first day. She doesn't lose interest either, instead becoming even more invested in Graystripe's interesting life and skills. They keep practicing together for several days, and on one of these days they are stopped by Duke, who arrives with a couple of his lackeys... to scare them, I suppose? He doesn't have any other reason. Millie is ready to leave the clearing to Duke immediately, but Graystripe declares that a warrior would stand and fight. So as soon as he jumps into attack, Millie turns and joins him, and together they end up beating back Duke and his lackeys. Millie is ecstatic that they did the impossible, but this battle filled Graystripe with memories of battles in the forest, and he becomes brooding and sullen again as he realizes that this little kitty pet battle isn't a substitute for actually returning to his clan. Millie tells Graystripe that she understands now, and that he belongs in the clans. But Graystripe says that he can't, and doesn't even know if the clans exist anymore. Millie is surprised that he's giving up, and Graystripe gets angry with her for assuming anything about him. Back in his two-leg nest, Graystripe gets another Silverstream dream, and she tells him that he is a ThunderClan warrior, and that he already knows he must go back. Essentially repeating Millie's message with only one addition, Silverstream mentions that Graystripe may already have the perfect traveling companion. Which is Millie, of course. One of Graystripe's two leg kits gently brings him downstairs and lets him outside, and Graystripe even rubs up against his leg in thanks before he sets off for good. He goes to find Millie and tells her that he is, in fact, going to find his clan, and that he wants her to come with him. Millie is shocked and flattered, but she says no. She likes her two legs, she likes the two leg place, and even if Graystripe's life is exciting and she likes him, she can't just drop her whole life on a whim to pad after him. Graystripe is sad, but accepts her decision and leaves on his own. Millie goes back inside to her very nice two-leg, who is offering her a special treat at the top of her own cat tree. Around the house are tons of little toys and decorations and beds with Millie's name on them that show just how loved Millie is in her house. Millie doesn't know what she should do. Back with Graystripe, he immediately got lost and is back to getting into danger and wandering aimlessly around similar streets. Ten days into his journey, and without many or any meals since he left, he collapses in a car yard where he has a nightmare about all of his clanmates calling out to him. But it turns out what he was hearing was Millie's voice as she found him. Millie explains how tracking him, even with the skill she learned, was really difficult since Graystripe had wandered around so randomly, and since it turns out he's been going in circles. Millie gets him some water and a mouse, and tells him she has decided to come with him after all, because she wanted to be as loyal to Graystripe as Graystripe was to ThunderClan and because he's a cat she wants to share her life and path with. Millie then asks Graystripe why he called her Silverstream when he was still delirious. Graystripe tells her about his previous mate, and then they set off together, ready to start their journey now that they have each other to rely on. 
I am not a particularly skilled or dedicated artist. That isn't my main job, and I don't know much about it, at least not to the level where I would feel right in heavily critiquing or teaching other artists. As such, I won't spend much time in any of the mangas or graphic novels discussing the art. But since this is a completely new medium, I want to say something about it. Having art, especially with the expressiveness that James Barry uses, helps to get across the feelings and intensity of the scenes much quicker, and allows the story to skip over any long areas of description for environments or cats' appearances and movements, along with the continuous clarifications to who is speaking at any given moment. It's an efficient form of storytelling from the reader's perspective, Though, of course, making this art takes much longer than just writing the equivalent story. And with the physical size of art pieces in comparison to paragraphs, even a 300-page manga wouldn't get across as much information or speed through as much plot as a 300-page book. And, for the record, this manga was 95 pages long. It therefore couldn't possibly tell as vast or as long of a story as a main series book. But I do have a couple small criticisms with how they spent their time, knowing how important every panel was in the smaller space. The story is a bit too circular and dragging, with a lot of the same elements repeated over and over, and random filler sections like the first Silverstream and Feathertail dream, or the part where Millie is gone and Graystripe takes the time to scare two random unnamed kitty pets. I do appreciate the story as it is, but the repetition without much of any interesting plot beats makes this first book feel very slow. It's entirely possible that the pace will pick back up in future entries, now that Millie and Graystripe are actually on their journey, but it was off here. As for the characters, Graystripe is... strange. He feels more like an inversion of Graystripe as we knew him to be in the first arc than an accurate representation of his character. First arc Graystripe was pretty disloyal and didn't think through his choices, but he was also very compassionate, determined, optimistic, and humorous. The manga's Graystripe has so far been characterized primarily around his loyalty, a quality that even Millie praises as being what drew her to him along with him being grumpy, volatile, brooding, and thinking meticulously about plans but giving up on them rather easily without being propped up by both of his love interests. It's possible that this character is more similar to the version of Graystripe from The New Prophecy or Dawn, but we didn't really see enough of him in that arc to tell. I should point out that I don't hate this character, I actually enjoy watching him so far, but he doesn't strike me as being much like Graystripe. <laughs> Except, perhaps, for him enjoying life with the two legs. If any clanborn cat was to actually enjoy having all the food and belly rubs they could want, I think it would be Graystripe. How about our other main character to be, though? Millie here is what I would consider the best part of the book. She goes through her own complete arc as she learns not only to hunt, fight, and appreciate Graystripe's past, but how to apply her newfound skills to her existing prowess in the Too Late Place with navigation and communication. She learns to be brave, stand up for what she believes, and makes a very hard choice all on her own without any cat pressuring her to leave her home and choose a new life mostly to help out one cat in need. She's honestly a strong, likable, admirable cat. I'm glad that this is basically the first time we're getting to know her. Oh, and there is one other thing in here that makes me feel warm and fuzzy, and strangely, it's the two legs. As you will eventually see, making greater use of two legs becomes a pattern in the mangas, though this is less true in the newer vein of graphic novels. Some of this involves just being in more urban environments where mean two legs can be dangerous, but plenty of other areas of these books involve really sweet interactions with two legs and cats. And The Lost Warrior is no exception. Graystripe's entire family of two legs is really sweet and seem to truly care for Graystripe, enough that the warrior feels bad when he hurts their feelings and regret when he decides to leave. And Millie's two leg is a sweet old lady who, even in the couple of panels we get with her, clearly loves, cares about, and does her best to help Millie. It isn't something the book puts a massive amount of focus on, but considering we are human readers and many of us like and either have or want pet cats, these sort of good, wholesome relationships that you don't get in the main series can be a sweet little gift in the mangas. Graystripe's first solo adventure was certainly a little underwhelming with its slow pace, strangely characterized main character, and as of yet unremarkable plot. But it is a pretty good start into the worlds of Graystripe and graphic novels, and I am excited to see what this new medium can provide for the series. It has already given me an appreciation for Millie and the two legs that gave homes to our characters, but going forward into their journey, I'm sure it has a lot more to offer. Visceral emotions, impactful battle scenes, or simply more slice-of-life adventures. With the speed of comic production, it will be a while until we can continue with this story, but I'm excited to see where it goes in a future episode of our trip through time.